Biotechnology. When we talk about biotechnology, we think about the future it'll bring. Where I hail from, the startup hub of San Francisco, we like to paint the rosy fantasy world where biotechnology will solve all of our problems, from disease to cancer. But there's an equal number of people in my neck of the woods that passionately warn against the ecological calamity which engineering life could bring. As with every emerging technology, the fears and the fantasies that this future technology could bring are equally great, but they're also equally wrong. See, it's really hard to predict the future. To kind of give you some context, let's talk about uh, more developed technology. Computers. So when computers were first developed, uh, they were the size of a room and only used by academics to make calculations. Really, the thought of the average person using computer seemed absurd. Finally, though, we made computers that could fit on a desktop. And the experts thought, ah, yes, people would also use these just to make calculations, you know, a little personal finance. But then amateurs got a hold of the technology and they did the unexpected. They made computer games. So instead of computers making life just easier, they were making life more fun. Now computers are completely integrated into our lives. They fuel our economy, and most importantly, they're how we express ourselves socially. And it's a social expression that's influenced our politics and has radically changed how kids are socialized today. And it's only at this point that we are beginning to look at computers' impact on society. We need to talk about biotechnology now, as it's emerging, to help guide its use and prepare society for its impact. So, is it wrong to change a gene in an embryo so that it doesn't have childhood cancer? How is that different than changing a gene so that the child has blue eyes? How about blue skin? What if in order to protect the child against childhood cancer, it would necessarily have to have blue eyes and blue skin? The ethical issues around biotechnology are murky and involve not just how and when the technology is used, but also who has access to the technology altogether. So we can all agree. We should probably talk about uh, genetic engineering, synthetic biology, biotechnology, GMOs. But as you can see, we immediately run into a problem. Terminology. What are we talking about? How can we have a meaningful conversation about something we can't touch, we can't see, or really talk about in detail without a PhD? Maybe we can just let the experts figure it out chaperone in the future for us, <laughs> right? But, you know, that works when we want to do the, keep doing the things the same way by the same types of people. But there's a group of hackers and scientists who wanted to liberate science from the confines of academia and industry to build spaces so people would have access to the tools of biotechnology without discrimination on gender, or in gender, what else? Oh, um, race, or even educational background. I am one of those scientists. My name is Mary Ward, and I help co-found Counterculture Labs, a lab open to everyone. Okay. While you might like fully support access to technology, how do you feel about amateurs tinkering with genomes? How would you feel if these amateurs were in your backyard? Our lab is in a neighborhood, and I saw a real need to welcome our neighbors in for a discussion. But how are we gonna get past politically charged terms like GMOs to have a meaningful conversation about fears? 
You see, when technologists and civil society talk about biotech, they miss each other's points. That's my lap, by the way. Uh, <laughs> they miss each other's points. Technologists miss the critical social impact that a technology can have, and civil society misses out on the nature of the technology itself. And this is because, like I said before, words, terminology, they keep us in the present discourse and forget and prevent us from moving on towards the future. So we would have to get past words, maybe use some visual aids, uh, but pretty pictures of proteins don't really capture what the future could bring. They don't tell a story. Just like in my example with computers, we have, n have no idea what the future can bring. It's not really based on fact. We need to bring in some really creative folks who can imagine something different. To, so to do that, the special folks I'm talking about are artists. Artists for a long time have served the role of making the intangible visual, like emotions of fear and love. There's actually a group of artists that are embracing the tools of technology, biotech in fact. They're called bioartists. And these bioartists see the, the PCR machine like a paintbrush and cells, a new media with which to sculpt, to transform, and to communicate. That's right. Bioartists are using scientific tools to answer non-scientific questions, to be a form of activism, and call us to question what we view as normal. For example, Andrew Zaraki out of New York City School of Visual Arts asked, what is faith? What gives holy water its transformative power? He went around to all the cathedrals and collected samples of holy water. Uh, that holy water he put into a PCR machine and amplified the DNA. He then sequenced that DNA. And what he found was that this water contained a Noah's Ark worth of species in just one drop. He put those sequence data into a book, and that book was thicker than the Bible. Kind of gives us a new perspective on the mystery. Mary Magic, out of MIT, asked, what is femininity? Her art invokes a critique of the politics around fertility and gender by making DIY estrogen a regulated hormone by the body politic. So by extracting estrogen from women's urine using stuff that you can get at the grocery store, her work brings into light the availability of natural and synthetic estrogens in our environment. Her work is both of education and also of activism to decolonize bodies from political control. Adam Zielinski would make his child have blue eyes and blue skin and centipede limbs and scales instead of hair. While you might be appalled, Adam would ask you to think more deeply about what you believe it means to be human. Does it matter how many limbs you have? Does it matter how much hair you have? Does it make someone less human to have a different color skin? So bioartists like Mary, Adam, and Andrew force us to look at the darker side, the shadow sides of what it means to be human, and really dig deeper into our own biases before we begin to judge other people's ideas. So really, they're helping us understand who we are now. But could artists help us understand who we would be in a biotech future? Well, it was this question that brought artists and technologists together at our community lab in Oakland, California. And how 
the art event genetically altered was born. Oops. Uh, unlike um, uh, like academic and industry labs, artists could come into our labs freely, team up with members, and actually have the opportunity to become makers in biotech. So over the next three months, designers, artists, and performers worked on pieces for the show. Genetically Altered was a platform for discussion to elevate us above words as it dropped us into a visual and tangible future. Not a passive art show where visitors could keep a safe, objective distance. No, this was an experience where people would be sculpted, like an artist sculpts a piece of clay. So when people came in to the show, they saw a bustle of activity, virtual reality, mind-altering light therapy, humanoids, like they had never seen before, a great open-air chapel, and an altar in that chapel, above which hung a human-sized orb. Kind of like travelers dropped into an exotic culture, the visitors of the show were completely immersed in a new world. While they had come just to observe, they were integrated to become transformed. Through body modification and costume, patrons became players. So people coming later on during the program had no idea who was with the production and who was a guest. And so as the evening progressed, the people coming from the streets, the normal looking people were the abnormal ones. And the people with these body modifications, extra limbs, facial paint, these new human beings, these bioqueers, that was the normal. So as the night progressed, everyone was welcomed into the great open air chapel. See, all the bustle was for a special occasion. It was for a birth. So the ceremony that they witnessed well, it had a lot of familiar themes, kind of like a Catholic mass. But instead of communion, the priests performed a bacterial transformation. See, in this future, the virgin birth was not due to the will of God, but rather, there's the altar, but rather to the technological achievement of an artificial womb that great orb that hung above the altar. Experiences have a way of binding us together and are a part of something that we really can't ignore. What people experienced made them feel like the odd one out. They were exposed to a new norm and a new future. With their ontologies wrecked, they were actually free to have creative thought about a future that could be. Artists and their art are the future of biotechnology. Because biotechnology is moving from something, a tool to fix our problems to a means of self-expression. And this is because it's been released from the confines of academia and industry. And people are doing biotechnology on their kitchen tables. And you're seeing it displayed at your local gallery. And what's beautiful about this is that this creative movement is being empowered by including all stakeholders in the use and applications of biotechnology. In the future, Artists will be writing genomes just as fluently as Blake or Byron wrote verse. Life will be poetry. So yes, we don't know what the future may hold, but artists will help us see the possibilities. Thank you.